So welcome back. Thank you again for being here. And uh, and so far we have looked at uh, the beginning of this 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 class around the introduction to the sacraments. And so so far we've talked about uh, just the idea that this illustration that we find in the Catechism and in the introduction of the sacraments uh, represents the the power of God coming forth to us. That's how the, the Catechism describes sacraments. They are the power of God coming forth to us, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we looked at the sacraments are efficacious signs of grace. That means they actually have the effect for which they're signified. Uh, they are instituted by Christ. They come directly from Him through the apostles and through the church. They are entrusted to the church, and by what by which divine life, eternal life, being partakers of the divine nature, is dispensed to us, right? So they are pure grace. There's nothing we can do to earn divine nature, right? There's nothing I could ever, I couldn't ever be good enough. I couldn't pray enough. I couldn't be holy enough. And they are pure grace towards us. And so in this week, uh, oh, I forgot this slide. The fruit of the sacramental life is that the spirit of adoption makes the faithful partakers in the divine nature in uniting them in this living union with the Son, our Savior. So it's all about this living union with Christ. And so this week we come to the Holy Eucharist and, uh, and we'll begin with the introduction to the Eucharist in the Catechism. This is the very first paragraph, and so it says the Holy Eucharist completes Christian initiation. In other words, it, it, uh, it finishes first a person becoming complete in Christ, right? And uh, a, a complete Christian. Those who have been raised to the dignity of the royal priesthood by baptism and configured more deeply to Christ by confirmation participate with the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice by means of the Eucharist. So, so there, you know, the, so the catechism is is just just like it always does in this very first par paragraph, is is laying out uh, kind of like the plan, the important aspects of uh, this Eucharistic celebration, and of course it's going to harken back to the other sacraments because those other sacraments uh, come before Holy Communion, and and it says you you know remember when we did baptism we talked about all kinds of effects that it has right. And we talked about it as the, the sacrament of the crucifixion, that we enter, that we are united to Christ in this living union, and so that we are united with him in some mysterious and profound way when he is crucified and when he is buried and when he rises again, and that, uh, that we are one with him through baptism. And, and that has a, all kinds of profound effects. So it's interesting that the Catechism, at this point in introducing the Eucharist, says... It highlights one particular aspect of baptism. And what it highlights is this idea that we have been raised to the dignity of the royal priesthood. Right? So that, what, so that our participation in Christ, our union with Christ, uh, is, is a participation in his priesthood. See, that's really important. That's that's. That's an indication that this idea of us being baptized into the priesthood of Christ is very significant for this idea of the Eucharistic celebration. And so then it goes on and it says we are configured more deeply to Christ by confirmation. And remember we talked about this idea that our characters, there are certain sacraments that change our character, right? That, that conform us to the image of Christ, and that the Holy Spirit's job, through the gifts and through the fruits of the Holy Spirit, is to conform us to Christ so that we can be effective witnesses. And so we talked about confirmation being the, the, uh, the sacrament of evangelization. And so, so it's like, okay, so we're, we're, the priesthood and being figured, configured to Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit is the way by which we participate with the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice. Okay? First paragraph. Second paragraph in this introduction. It says, At the Last Supper, on the night that he was betrayed, our Savior instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body 
and blood. We're all familiar with that, right? <clears throat> this he did in order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages until he should come again. I want to pause there. Right? So he did that in order to perpetuate. That idea of perpetuation means to make it last, right? <laughs> Perpetual means unending. In like it just it continues on, which which is kind of weird because the cross is an event, right? It happens at a particular hour. It happens on a particular day, during a particular month, during a particular year, in a particular place. It's it's rooted and grounded in time. And yet, somehow, by the this institution of this uh, this this sacrament, Christ is going to, to lift it out of time so that it can be present for all time. That's pretty amazing, right? And so he says, uh, he did this in order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages. So, so in, a, in a very real way, that moment, that hour, that day in time, and actually we would, we would think of it more as, as the entire event of the, of the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. That's really all one event. That's what we call the Paschal Mystery. That's why when we celebrate the, uh, the Holy Trium at, during Holy Week, uh, there's only one Mass, right? It starts on Holy Thursday, it continued on Holy Friday, and it ends at the Easter Vigil, right? It's all one event. In a very real way, that one event is eternally present through the Eucharist. We're going to find, that, find out a lot more about that. Like, like I said, this is the introduction. So what the introduction is, is just like throw some ideas out there to, to like kind of plant some seeds, and then we're going to dig into those seeds. Okay? And he says, uh, And so to entrust to his beloved spouse, the church, a memorial of his death and resurrection, We'll come back and talk about what, what does that mean to have a memorial. A sacrament of love. I, you know, usually when I, I, if you said, what's the sacrament of love, I would have said marriage. Which is very appropriate, <laughs> because in marriage, uh, there's a giving of bodies to each other, right? And, and there's this, uh, this expression of love in a bodily form which is very related to this. The idea, of course, the sacrament of love, is what Paul says, that on the cross, Christ was demonstrating his love for us. He was manifesting his love for us. That all of the love that he had for you, and for me, was made, uh, was, was demonstrated, was uh, was was acted, it's not even acted out, it's hard to express, right? <laughs> it's made real through this action of his sacrifice on the cross for us. The interesting thing is that that fullness of love is present at every Mass. Right? That, that unconditional, passionate, personal, intimate love that he gave himself on the cross for each of us, as well as for the entire planet, through all of time, is present. We'll come back to that. It's a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet in which Christ is consumed, referring, of course, to the Passover and the Passover lamb, which gets eaten. Um, the mind is filled with grace. I thought it was interesting that they used mind. Right? I would have said, like, the soul was filled with grace. So, mind. Now, that's, a, that's an interesting thing, that our minds are filled with grace. And I think, what I hope is that when you understand what is really happening, then it really is a mindful change, right? It's a, it's a change in how we perceive it. And a pledge of future glory. So the Catechism is going to dig into each one of these, and we're going to look at most of them. And it goes on, it says, the Eucharist is the source and the summit of Christian life. This is quoting a uh, Vatican II document, Lumen Gentium, and, uh, and it says, the source means it's literally the word is fount, right? So it's like the, the spring, it's the, it's the place where the Christian life 
has its origin. Now, when you, again, usually when we think of Eucharist, we're thinking like, uh, you know, the, the Blessed Sacrament itself. In, in this term, it's like, it is the Eucharist in all of its fullness, because, of course, uh, as you'll see at the end of this paragraph, we're talking about Christ himself, right? And so when you, at the source, uh, we, when we're talking about the Eucharist, we're talking about that thought in the divine uh, mind, in the Trinitarian relationship where before anything is created, he makes a plan to share his divine life. Right? The very first paragraph of the Catechism says, I am, you know, the, the whole reason anything exists is because God wanted to share his divine life. He wanted to share his experience of Trinitarian life with us. That's the source. And then, of course, the summit includes all of creation and all of time and all of redemption and all of sanctification and finds its fulfillment at the wedding supper of the Lamb at the end of time when Christ and the church are united in reality in this profound and amazing way, right? And the Eucharist is all of those things. You remember, even... In the celebration of the Eucharist, uh, right before we receive communion, it's you know the priest says, "Blessed are those who are called to the wedding feast, right? The wedding banquet." So you so you can see it's like so this isn't just this it, it's it's totally and completely real now, but it's also anticipated, right? And so it's the source and summit. The other sacraments, indeed, all. Ecclesiastical ministries and works of apostolates are bound up with the Eucharist and are orientated towards it. The whole reason the church exists and everything it does, whether it's feeding the poor or whether it's education or whether it's liturgy or whether it's sacraments, everything is about this union that occurs at the cross and death and burial and resurrection of Christ. For in the Blessed Eucharist is contained the whole spiritual good of the Church, namely Christ himself, our Pasch, our Passover Lamb. <clears throat> and the Eucharist is an efficacious sign, just like all the other sacraments, right? It actually has the effect and the sublime cause of that communion in the divine life, in the communion of the divine life, and that unity of the people of God by which the church is kept in being. And so, so you think this Eucharist is what keeps us united with the divine life, in communion with the divine life, and it's also what holds the church together. Without, of course, without Christ's sacrifice on the cross, there would be no church. There would be no communion between us, right? There would be no us sharing in the divine life. <laughs> and so the Eucharist both uh, has that effect and also is the cause of that. And it also is the culmination both of God's action in sanctifying the world in Christ. So it's the, the, uh, the grand finale of God's working to bring redemption to the world and of worship men offer to Christ through and through him to the Father through the Holy Spirit. Now this is really important uh, to notice. There's two things going on, right? There is this uh, sanctifying action, this redemption that's taking place, this, uh, this uh, you know, men introduced sin into our natures and into all of creation, and that has to be redeemed. We need to be sanctified. That that is uh, a part of this Eucharistic celebration. But then it says, and it's also the worship that we are offering to Christ and through Christ to the Father. All right, so there's two aspects, and we're going to see those really clearly as we're going through the Catechism, that with every Eucharistic celebration you have this uh, sacrificial uh, redemption thing going on, and also the offering of praise and worship and thanksgiving. <laughs> So the Catechism, that's the end of the introduction. Oh, no, it's not. Look, there's another slide. <laughs> Finally, 
told you that I hadn't had much time to finish this. Finally, by the Eucharistic celebration, we already unite ourselves with the heavenly liturgy. Okay, so, so there's, a, there's a liturgy, kind of interesting, going on in heaven. Right, there's this praise and thanksgiving and offering and intercession going on in heaven, and at the Mass, we are already entering into that heavenly liturgy. We'll explore that a little bit more. Uh, and also, we anticipate eternal life. We look forward to the wedding feast. Okay, so there's a lot going on, and, uh, and as we uh, go through this whole section in the Catechism, we'll dig down into some of these. <clears throat> the next section is about the names of the Eucharist. Uh, it, it, there's lots of them. Every one of them you could spend quite a bit of time on. The Lord's Supper, the Wedding Feast of the Lamb, uh, the Table of the Lord, all of those have significance and, and scriptural roots and, and different things they're communicating. We really don't have time to dig into those. Uh, but I did want to highlight two of the most common ones so that we'd know what we're saying when we talk about it. And the first is Eucharist. Um, Eucharist is a Greek word which literally means thanksgiving. And so uh, it's called Eucharist because it is an action of thanksgiving to God. We're going to see what that means to, to give thanks to God. More, but it says, the, for, for his works in creation and redemption and sanctification. And I think it's, a, it's important to recognize, like, you know, this thanksgiving idea isn't... Um, isn't that I'm just like giving thanks for my new car, or for my job, or my house, or my food. It's not that type of thanksgiving, right? It, it's actually elevated, because what we're doing at the Mass is entering into something that's very, it's cosmic, right? And so we're, we're entering into this idea that we're thanking God for all of creation. And we're, th and we're thanking God for all of his work of redemption through all of time. Of, of, of offering humankind an opportunity to, to enter into this divine life. And, and the sanctification has to do with holiness, right? And, and wholeness, the healing from the effects of sin. And so when we're coming to the Eucharistic celebration, we're coming to give thanks to God for all of this work that he has done. And it's interesting that, you know, we'd say, like, you know, uh, it would be interesting if we started saying, like, I'm going, uh, I'm going to give thanks, right? Because that's what we're saying when we say, I'm, I'm going to go, you know, go to, go to the Eucharist. I'm, gonna, I'm going to give thanks. It's like, well, what are you giving thanks for, right? That would give us an opportunity to say, like, you know, most people say, oh, you're going, you're going to Mass. We'll talk about Mass in a minute. We're going to the Eucharist. It's sort of like whatever, right? It's some sort of religious thing that you have that I have no idea what that word means. But, you know, if you said, I'm going to go give thanks, well, people know what that means. It's like, oh, that's kind of cool. This, this, like a thankful person, right? They're, they have gratitude. They're, they're thankful, and that's why they're going to this church. <laughs> See? See, it's a different, like, when you think of it, it's like, okay, this, so this has to do with thanksgiving. We're going to dig down into that in a minute. Uh, the next one, of course, is the Mass, which is, uh, the name that we call it most of the time, I'm going to Mass, uh, that comes from the, uh, the Latin word for being sent, and that's the very last piece of the liturgy, where either the priest or the deacon says, you know, go forth, the Mass has ended. That means we're being sent, right? That's the missa, where uh, uh, it's, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it, it's being sent out to mission. So when we say I'm going to Mass, what, I'm, what we're saying is I'm going to be sent out. Right? I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to this place where I'm going to be sent. Which is, which is kind of a weird thing, right? But, but that's what we're saying every time I say I'm going to Mass. I'm going to a place where I'm going to be sent. That's kind of an interesting way. It's like, okay, so what does that mean? I'm going to give thanks, and I'm going because I'm going to be sent out from this place. See, these words are important, and we use them all the time, but nobody knows, you know, nobody ever thinks about it or knows what they mean. And so, you know, if, if you're not a Catholic and a Catholic says, I'm going to Mass, then a non-Catholic is sort of like, like okay, that, like, whatever, whatever you guys, whatever you Catholics do, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the Eucharist and Salvation History, the Catechism has this whole section 
on the Eucharist and salvation history, which is uh, amazing and wonderful and fun to study. Uh, there is there's just no way that we could go through uh, this, the Eucharist and salvation history. Uh, in, uh, on Monday nights, uh, I, we had a group of people who were interested in doing this, and so we decided to go ahead and do it. On Monday nights, starting on November 4th, which is a week from tomorrow, uh, we're going to be going through Brant Petrie's presentation on the Eucharist. It's the Lexio Divino from uh, uh, the Augustine Institute. It's a 10-part series where he goes through uh, all the scriptures related to the Eucharist in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So you can imagine that's 10 hours where they're teaching just on these paragraphs from the uh, Catechism. What date was that? Uh, it's, it's called Lectio Eucharist, and it's on, we're starting Monday, November 4th at 6 o'clock right here. Excellent series, but just to give you a taste of of the types of things that you can explore, uh, so you, you'd start in the creation story, and in the creation story you have the story of Adam and Eve being placed in this garden, and they're told to till and to keep it, which of course we would think tilling, I know what that means, it's gardening, right? But uh, of course uh, the, the way that we garden is, is a result of, uh, is, is after the fall, and, and of course Part of the fall is that the ground is cursed, right? And so, so we have this idea of what, like, I know what telling means, but but in the Hebrew mind, it's totally different because that that keeping and tilling are liturgical words that are used in Leviticus, talking about the priesthood and their job at the temple. And so, so when for a Hebrew reading Genesis, when they read those words, they would say, "Oh, Adam and Eve were called to be." priests, right? They were the priests of creation. They were the voice of all of creation and being able to give thanksgiving uh, to God and thanks to God for their existence and for his provision for them and for his care and providence, right? And so you have this, this, uh, this, this image of humanity being this, the priests of creation. And of course we know that that gets totally demolished in the fall, and then you have this very interesting place, you know, where the, you know, the promise of salvation, we can't go into any of that, but it's just interesting to notice that after they are kicked out of the garden, an angel is placed there, and, the, and, and what it says is, the angel's placed on them to keep them away from the tree of life so that they cannot eat and live forever. Right? The only other place in the entire Bible where living forever and eating are found. The only other scripture in the entire scriptures is John chapter 6, where Jesus says, if you eat my flesh, you will live forever. See, so, so immediately, you should think, Jesus is flesh. That, that's the tree of life, right? <laughs> right? That's, and so you can go through... This you can go through the scriptures all the way through, and and so you have the story of uh, Abraham and Melchizedek. You've got the you know the offering of first fruits, where where the thanksgiving for the harvest, and, and a, a, a thing of faith, where I give give the very first things that I harvested to God. Uh, you'd have the Passover, of course, and the Passover lamb. Tons of symbolism there. Uh, the whole Exodus and the manna in the wilderness. The all the sacrifices offered in the temple. And all the rubrics around them all point forward to the cross, the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, and of course John chapter 6 itself, which is just full and rich, and you can talk about that for hours. You can talk about any one of these for hours, but we're just skipping right over those, okay? <laughs> and we're going immediately to the Last Supper. And like I said, like uh, this again, this mystery is so deep and rich and profound that we really don't have any choice if we're if we're uh, not going to be here for the next six weeks. <clears throat> so it says, the institution of the Eucharist, uh, it, uh, Holy Thursday, there's three great mysteries that, that happen in, uh, in that uh, event. And the first is a commandment to love. Remember, Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. And then he demonstrates that by washing their feet. And so this, 
and, and, and of course, it's, he's not telling them to love in, in a human way. He's, he's saying, love as I have loved, right? So he loves with divine love. He loves with unconditional love. He loves with, with unending love. And he's saying, you are called to love with divine love. That you receive the divine love, and then you're able to give the divine love, right? And, and so the commandment to love is there. The institution of the Eucharist. This is my body, this is the blood of the new covenant. And at that same moment when he says, do this in memory of me, the establishment of the priesthood. We'll look at that when we get to ordination, of course. <laughs> and so the first paragraph in this section says, in order to leave them a pledge of this love, this divine love that we were talking about, and in order never to depart from his own, so he wants to be with us, right? Remember at, at the... Uh, at the right before he ascends into heaven, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he says, "I will be with you always." Right? He never wants to leave us. He makes a promise never to leave us. Now we know that God is everywhere present, so He's always been with us, right? So he can't be talking about that because He's always been everywhere all the time. So when He says, "I will always be with you," He must be talking about something else. He's talking about. Uh, the Eucharist. He says, I will always be with you. So, in other words, I'm, I am not really leaving. So, in order never to depart from us and to make them sharers in his Passover, we'll come back to that, the idea that, of course, when we talk about baptism, we talk about us being crucified with Christ, right? being united with him in his crucifixion. So we become sharers in his Passover. He instituted the Eucharist as a memorial of his death and resurrection and commanded the apostles to celebrate it until he returned. <laughs> and so the, uh, the, the catechism goes on from there to talk about the history of the Mass, which is really fascinating. Uh, they spend a lot of time with St. Justin, uh, St. Justin wrote in the middle of the second century, and he describes a Mass. Uh, of course, part of the accusations against Catholics, Christians, were that they were cannibals, right? They had this secret meeting that people weren't allowed to go to unless they had been initiated, and they ate flesh and blood there, right? And so, obviously, uh, they're cannibals. And so, Justin writes... Uh, an apology, which is like a defense of Christianity, and in it he describes what Christians do. So you remember, this is 155. Justin was, uh, was, was a bishop. He was trained by a bishop. Um, the, um, uh, you know, tradition has it that the bishop who trained Justin was trained by the Apostle John. So I mean, we're not talking very far into the history of Christianity, right? And so he, Justin uh, uh, says a couple of things that are kind of interesting in this section. He says, we call this food Eucharist, and no one may take part in it unless he believes that what we teach is true. That's kind of an interesting requirement, right? And so, so Justin, you know, 150, 150, 160, is saying, one of the requirements for receiving the Eucharist is that you believe what, we, what the church teaches is true. Uh, I, when I came back to the church, because I had been, I had had a public ministry of teaching things that the church does not teach, I had to make a public proclamation that I believe that everything the church teaches is true and from God. <laughs> right? In order for me to be restored to the Eucharist. We still believe this now. We don't always practice it. Unfortunately, because I think that causes lots of confusion, but one of the basic requirements from the very beginnings of the church, you have to believe what the church teaches. You have to have received baptism for forgiveness and new birth. That's pretty reasonable. And you have to live in keeping with what Christ taught. Okay? That makes sense. You have to believe, you have to believe what the church teaches, you have to be baptized, and you have to live accordingly. He goes on, he says, It is not as common bread and common drink to receive these, 
But in like manner, as Jesus Christ our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So he's talking about the reality, like he's divine, but he's fully human. So likewise we have been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word, and from which our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished, so we're nourished by this uh, by what we're receiving is the flesh and blood that J- of that Jesus who was made flesh. So this I this you know what Justin des- he describes a mass. He describes the uh, you know the we, we read the scriptures as long as we can, and then the person who's presiding over it gives us a a, a a homily on you know how to live these things faithfully, and then we bring up our offerings, and then there's a prayer over the offerings, a long prayer, he said, <laughs> over the offerings. <laughs> and so, what's interesting about that section is, when you're reading through it, it's like, that's what we do today, right? He describes the Mass that we celebrate today all over the world from uh, 1900 years ago. That's pretty amazing, right? <clears throat> and so it says, Christians come together in one place for the Eucharistic Assembly, and at its head is Christ himself, the principal agent of the Eucharist. He is high priest of the new covenant. It is he himself who presides invisibly over every Eucharistic celebration. Okay, so, so, he, so now we begin to enter into this little cosmic thing, right? <laughs> right, where, where we come to Mass, and, uh, and what the Catechism is telling us is that Christ himself is the person who's presiding over this Mass as the High Priest of the New Covenant. The Catechism goes on and says, it is in representing him, Christ, that the bishop or priest acting in the person of Christ. Right? So it's so in a very real way, it's not the priest anymore. That's the idea of the, the vestments, right? It's just like this is not an individual human being anymore, that he is in the person of Christ. He is, he is uh, representing Christ. It is actually Christ who is doing it. Remember when we when we first started looking at the the Catechism Defining Sacraments, it said, it it is Christ himself who baptizes. It is Christ himself who consecrates the bread and the wine. He presides over the assembly, speaking after the readings, receiving the offering, and saying the Eucharistic prayer. It says, we offer to the Father what he has himself given us the gifts of his creation, bread and wine, which, by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the words of Christ, have become the body and blood of Christ. Christ is thus, really and mysteriously, made present. So you can see, you start out with bread and wine. Uh, the, one, of the, one of the very beginning part of the uh, Eucharistic prayer is the epiclesis, where the priest holds his hands, over the bread and the wine, right? Uh, remember ordination, the Holy Spirit, the, the oil are rubbed on the priest's hands representing the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so you have the Holy Spirit over the bread and the wine. You know, there's imagery there, right? Because you have the, the, uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters of creation, right? So you, and you get that's over, you get, you get the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow Mary. Right? So you have, you have tons of biblical images here being manifested right in front of us every Sunday. Uh, that, you know, the Holy Spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy. And, and by the words of Christ, this is my body, this is my blood. You know, remember that, that, that in creation God speaks things into being. Right? That the, by the power of his word, uh, that things are created. And so he says, this is my body, this is my blood. So through the power of the Holy Spirit and by those words, the bread and wine become the body and the blood. We'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more. <clears throat> it says, in the Eucharistic sacrifice, the whole of creation 
loved by God, is presented to the Father through the death and resurrection of Christ. Through Christ, the church can offer the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving for all that God has made good and beautiful and just in creation and in humanity. So this is the Thanksgiving part of the Mass, right? Mary says there's this, the Thanksgiving part and the sacra sacramental redemptional, redemptive part. Uh, actually, they're, they're one and the same. There's only one sacrifice, right? There's only one action going on in the Eucharistic sacrifice, but there's, there's these aspects. And so it says uh, all of creation, remember we talked about Adam and Eve being priests in the garden, right? Tilling and keeping. And remember at the beginning, the very first paragraph talked about our royal priesthood. So now we uh, are gathering up all of creation as priests to be able to offer praise, the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving for all that God has made that is good and beautiful and just in creation and in humanity. So we, and, and it's kind of interesting because... <clears throat> In, in, uh, it, it's not just that we are like restored to Adam's level, right, of priesthood, but that we are elevated into Christ's priesthood, right? We we are we share in the high priesthood of Christ Himself to offer this praise and worship and thanksgiving for all of creation. <clears throat> It says the Eucharist is a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Father, a blessing by which the church expresses her gratitude to God for all of his benefits, for all that he has accomplished through creation and redemption and sanctification. Eucharist means, first of all, thanksgiving. Remember at the very beginning of the Eucharistic prayer, the priest says, let us uh, give give thanks, I should have looked up the words, let us give thanks to the Lord, and we say, it is right and just, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. that is the, that's the beginning of this thanksgiving prayer, right? It, it is right and just for us to give thanks to the Creator, because He has created everything and holds it all together by the power of His being. The fact that I exist at all. Is, is I, I, my, I, I have stemmed immediately from a creation from God, right? It's not an accident that I'm here. It's not an accident that I'm going to live forever. It's, it's, it's not something that I can just take for granted that I'm going to be, be part of this divine uh, uh, play of the Trinity. This incredible existence that they share for all of eternity that he's invited me. He created me and invited me to be a part of that and accomplished it through the giving of himself on the cross. That's enough to give thanks for, right? <laughs> and so we're giving thanks. And we're doing that on, on not only our own behalf, but remember Paul says, all of creation is groaning, right? All of creation is affected by sin. All of creation, it, Paul says, is longing for the manifestation of the sons of God. Creation is looking for us to be who we're created to be in our relationship with God, to be the priests for creation. It's cool. You, I hope, you getting this cosmic stuff, right? <laughs> it says the Eucharist is also the sacrifice of praise by which the church sings the glory of God in the name of all creation. This sacrifice of praise is possible only through Christ. He unites the faithful to his person and to his praise and to his intercession, so that the sacrifice of praise to the Father is offered through Christ and with him and in him. Remember the final thing that, that the priest says, or one of them, I shouldn't say the final thing, at the end of the Eucharist prayer, in him and through him and with him, and we respond, Amen, right? <laughs> that this is, uh, again, it, our sacrifice of praise is tainted with sin. Right? We're not able, we don't even appreciate enough of what he's done. But this is, this is, we're uniting ourselves with his sacrifice of praise to the Father. And love for the Father. And thanksgiving to the Father. <clears throat> it says the Eucharist is also the memorial. So it's the thanksgiving. It's us representing our, exercising our priesthood. 
It's also the memorial of Christ's Passover, the making present, and the sacramental offering of his unique sacrifice in the liturgy of the church, which is his body. So it's the memorial of his Passover. And it says, in the sense of sacred scriptures, the memorial is not merely a, re a recollection of past events. It's not just a memory. It's not just like, oh, remember when that happened, right? Uh, like when, like when uh, you know, coming up soon, <laughs> gosh, my brain is so fried. Uh, we're going to have a, a memorial day, right? No, we're going to have Veterans Day, which is kind of a memorial day. And, and what we do then is that we remember, right? But in that remembering, what, whatever we're remembering, doesn't, it doesn't actually make it present to us, right? It, it's not like it's, it's happening again in front of us when we remember it. That's, that's our way of saying memorial. But scripturally, for, for Jews in the Hebrew mind, uh, when you say memorial, these past events, uh, are, they're not just merely a, a re recollection of past events, but the proclamation of the mighty works wrought by God for men. In the liturgical celebration of these events, they become, in a certain way, present and real. So even in the Jewish mindset, apart from Christianity, this, uh, this is how the Israelites understood the liberation from Egypt. Every time Passover is celebrated, the Exodus events are made present to the memories of the believers, so that they may conform their lives to them. All right, so it's when, when a, even a modern-day Jew celebrating Passover says, like, you know, God brought me out of Egypt, and now I can conform my life to the truth that God brought me out of Egypt. But when you get to the New Testament, the memorial takes on a new meaning, and when the church celebrates the Eucharist, she commemorates Christ's Passover, and it is made present. The sacrifice Christ offered once for all on the cross remains ever present. So you remember, like that scooping it up, right, out of the timeline, right? As often as the sacrifice of the cross by which Christ, our past, has been sacrificed, is celebrated on the altar, the work of our redemption is carried out. Now, you got to think, okay, so there's, there's one sacrifice, and in that sacrifice, redemption was purchased for all, right? But when you make that sacrifice present, it means the redemption that that sacrifice purchased is being purchased at that time, right? That, that the action that was accomplished in the event is still present. So it's not just the event that's present, it's the effects of the sacrifice are present. The, the Eucharist is thus a sacrifice because it re-presents, makes present the sacrifice of the cross because it is its memorial and because it applies its fruit. <laughs> Christ our Lord and God was once and for all to offer himself to God the Father by the death on the altar of the cross. To accomplish there, I thought there must be a typo here, to accomplish there an everlasting redemption. But because his priesthood was not to end in his death, at the Last Supper, on the night when he was betrayed, he wanted to leave to his beloved spouse, the church, a visible sacrifice. Okay? So you got to pause, got to pause here. It's like, so, so Jesus is, is uh, he, he's, he's at the Last Supper, he's about to offer himself up to the Father in this everlasting uh, uh, sacrifice. And what he wants to do is leave something visible with the church. So that, so that the, uh, this sacrifice that he's about to make can always be present to us. And it says, as the nature of man demands, which is kind of interesting, right? Because we're, we, we are creatures and we experience reality through our senses, right? So if, 
if, uh, if this chair over here was invisible, right, uh, it could still be there, it could still exist, but it wouldn't have, like, I wouldn't know that it was there, right? It was sort of like uh, physicists now talk about dark matter. They say there's something that they can't sense or perceive or measure, but it has, it's having an effect on the other bodies around it. They have no idea what it is, and so they call it dark matter. There's something there, but we can't perceive it. Well, if we can't perceive it, then it doesn't do us any good, really, right? Because we're physical beings. That's, that's how we experience reality, is through our, our seeing it and touching it and smelling it and tasting it. And so he says, he wants to leave this sacrifice for us so that we can experience it as human beings were created to experience things. To leave his beloved spouse, the church, a visible sacrifice by which the bloody sacrifice which he was to accomplish once for all on the cross would be represented, <laughs> right? Would be present all the time. Its memory perpetuated until the end of the world and its saving power be applied to the forgiveness of the sins that we commit daily. So that, so that in a very, like in, the, in this way that we can perceive and see and touch and taste, God makes the sacrifice present, the once for all sacrifice 2,000 years ago. He makes it present at every Mass today so that not only can we experience it, but we can receive the benefits from it. Okay, so that's uh, you know, so that's that's pretty amazing, right? Okay, so so you come to a mass, and so uh, when you walk in, it's like, okay, so I'm I'm entering into my role as a priesthood, and and I'm I'm about to offer thanksgiving to God for everything He's done in all of creation, all the goodness and all the beauty uh, and all the justice that I see in creation, and, and I'm going to bring all the praise for all of that beauty and justice and goodness to God. That's my my job, right? And and it's funny. Because when you think about the life of the Trinity, now let me just back up. When you think about the life of the Trinity, and you think about the interactions that Jesus and the Father have in the Gospels, you have this constant pouring out of each other, right? So the Father, it pours out all of his love for the Son, uh, giving of himself completely to the Son, and the Son receives it in the Holy Spirit, and then pours out all of his love and life and uh, being to the Father in love, and that's the constant dynamic of the Trinity, right? This constant self-giving, sacrificial love for each other. That's the dynamic that the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live in. That is the life of the Trinity. And so when Jesus becomes a, a man, he, you know, he says, I, I do everything to glorify the Father. Everything I do is to glorify the Father. And then the Father turns around and says, I'm going to glorify the Son, and he's going to give him a name of all names. <laughs> right? And so you have this, like, like no, I'm going to glorify you. And he's like, no, I'm going to glorify you. And so you have this, like, this giving, right? Constantly giving. And so when you think about the Mass, we are entering into this Trinitarian life. That's what the Mass is. Like we're, we're becoming one with the Trinitarian life. And so we come as these, uh, you know, kind of weak and foolish and miserable priests that we are, and we come with the, with the works of creation. You know, the, 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 the fruit of the vine and the work of human hands. And we offer bread and wine. That's our offering. We offer bread and wine. And the Lord takes that. He takes the bread and the wine and he pours out his Holy Spirit upon it and he transforms it into the one everlasting sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And he makes that present with all of its effects upon us. And then we turn around and with Christ, we unite ourselves with Christ on the altar and we offer ourselves back up to the Father with the Son for, the, for the redemption, for the sake of redemption, right? Right? And what does he do? He turns around and feeds us with his very life that we have just given him. Do you see how amazing that is, right? Like we're entering into this divine intera uh, you know, interactions of, of giving and then receiving and giving and receiving. And every time the giving and receiving happens, it is multiplied exponentially. It's amazing, right? So that would be enough. Right? <laughs> that would be enough, right? If we stopped there, like, we, that would give us enough to think about for a while. But, but the catechism goes on, 
And it says the Eucharist is also the sacrifice of the church. It says the church, which is the body of Christ, participates, participates in the offering of her head. With him, she herself is offered whole and entire. She unites herself to his intercession with the Father for all mankind. Remember, it says, you know, Christ died for the sins of the world. He died for every single human being that would ever exist. And so he's, he's interceding with the Father for every single human soul and that we enter into that sacrifice of intercession for all of humanity by uniting ourselves to the sacrifice. It says, in the Eucharist, in the, Eucharist the sacrifice of Christ becomes also the sacrifice of the members of his body. Well, that would make sense, right? Thinking baptismally, we would think, well, I am one with Christ, and I was with him on the cross. I was united with him in there. And so, in a very real way, if that, that cross is going to be present at every Mass, then I am also going to be part of the sacrifice. But, it's, but the weird thing here is that it says, with him, she herself is offered whole and entire. That means at every Mass, the entire church is present in this myster mis mystical and mysterious way because Christ and the church are one. And so the entire church is united with Christ in this offering to the Father. Whole and entire, which is which if you, if you just stop and think about that for a few minutes, it kind of freaks you out because it means that at every Mass offered throughout the world today, somehow, because I'm united with Christ and Christ was on all of those altars, I was on every one of those altars. Right? Whole and entire. The entire church is present. It says, the lives of the faithful, that's you and me, their praise, their sufferings, the prayer and work are united with those of Christ. Our entire lives and every aspect of our lives is united with Christ and with his total offering and so acquire new value. Do you remember, you know, like, okay, baptism, sacrament of, you know, of death, right? Like entering into the crucifixion, certainly being manifested here. Remember, we talked about the laying on of hands for confirmation. And the laying on of hands was this, uh, you, you did it to the sacrifice, you laid the hands on the bull, and then you killed the bull, right? So, so it's sort of like, okay, that, that confirmation has something to do with being consecrated for sacrifice. Well, here it is, Right? We are united with Christ. We are consecrated for sacrifice. Remember it says all the other sacraments are oriented towards this event, right? That's, those sacraments bring us to this moment where in my union with Christ through baptism, through the power of the Holy Spirit consecrating me to be a sacrifice, I can unite my life with Christ and offer it as a sacrifice for the redemption of mankind. You see, so many of us, you know, we think, it's like, I'm going to Mass. I'll be gone for an hour, and then when I come home, I'm going to eat lunch, right? It, like, what we don't realize is that we're entering into this, this other reality, we're entering into this cosmic reality that is actually outside of time. To enter into what God is accomplishing through all of time, for eternity. <laughs> How crazy is that, right? What would be more important than being able to somehow unite my measly little life with the sacrifice of Christ and, and somehow have it accrue some sort of value where I can offer it on behalf of the people I love? Isn't that crazy? <clears throat> to the offering of Christ are united not only the members still here on earth, 
Okay, so, so that's one thing for us to be able to do that, right? But the catechism goes on. But also those already in the glory of heaven. So you remember that the church whole and entire should have been, a, a, you know, we should have anticipated this, because you know, like, obviously the church isn't all on earth right now. In communion with and commemorate, commemorating the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, the church offers the Eucharistic sacrifice. In the Eucharist, the church is, as it were, at the foot of the cross with Mary, united with the offering and intercession of Christ. The church whole and entire. So at every Mass, all of heaven is present. That's why, uh, that's the beautiful thing about uh, if you visit some of the old churches. Uh, yesterday I was down in Brunswick doing some presentations at uh, the Church of St. John the Baptist. If you've ever been there, the, they've just, at the whole ceiling is painted with saints and angels and uh, images of Christ and images of the Father and images of the Spirit and, and the stained glass windows there. I don't know if they just had them cleaned or whatever, but they were super, I mean, of course the sun was shining too. I mean, like, it's just like, oh my gosh. You, and, and then they have statues of lots of saints, more than most churches have these days, because usually we just have the Blessed, the Blessed Mother and Joseph, but they had lots of different saints. And, and, the, and the whole point of that is to remind us, we're in, like, we're, we're, we're with all the church, right? <clears throat> it says that this Eucharistic sacrifice is also offered for the faithful departed who have died in Christ but are not yet wholly purified. So the souls in purgatory. Mm -hmm. In the belief, now this is the beginning of a quote, so here's the quote, in the belief that it is a great benefit to the souls on whose behalf the supplication is offered while the holy and tremendous victim is present. That's a beautiful way of expressing that, right? St. Cyril of Jerusalem from 1,700 years ago. <laughs> and so when we're at Mass and, and we think of our beloved friends and relatives who have passed, or someone who has just recently passed, and we, and we remember them in our prayers. Remember, there's, there's even a pause during Eucharist prayer of, of those who have departed, and then if the priest is taking his time, he'll pause. And if you're not paying attention, it's sort of like, oh, what, like, what, what's going on? How come it's quiet, <laughs> right? But if you're listening, then you realize, oh, this is the time for me to say, mom and dad and my brother and my sister, See what's happening there? See, it would be really fun to go through the entire liturgy and pull all of this out because it's all in there. We just don't hear it or recognize it. <clears throat> the mode of Christ's presence. Okay, so it's a little shifting gears here. It's gonna now it's talking about Christ's presence in this in this Eucharistic celebration. The mode of Christ's presence under the Eucharistic species is unique. It raises the Eucharist above all the sacraments as the perfection of the spiritual life and the end to which all the sacraments tend. Remember, it's the source and the summit, right? It's, it's everything. That's what this is. And so uh, his presence, because his presence is unique here, it has, uh, it, that's why it is the source and summit. In the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood, together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore the whole Christ, is truly and really and substantially contained. So it's, so, you know, we, we often say the body and blood, but what we're really saying is all of Christ, the whole Christ, all of his humanity and all of his divinity is present in the universe. It is really Jesus completely present. As a Protestant, I would often think, you know, like, 
how awesome it would have been to be able to be in the presence of Christ, right? And I, I can remember thinking, like, oh my gosh, it was like, you know, if you could have been there the day you fed the 5,000, or, you know, you could have, you know, been present to him somehow, like a woman that we're talking about with the issue of blood, you know, who just has this, like, oh my goodness, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. And I can remember studying the early church fathers on my way back into the Catholic church and discovering, oh my gosh, they believed that this was really Jesus. You know, they, they like, I wouldn't have been welcome in the early church, and, and I slowly come to this realization of, like, well, that's the only thing that makes sense with John chapter 6, right? And so I come to this place where I realize, oh my goodness, I think the Catholics have this right. This is what the, the church has always taught, right? The, the, you know, the reformers didn't have any authority to throw this out. How, like, how did that even happen? And, and so I hadn't even been going to Mass yet, but I knew about the, the in, in Waterville, on uh, uh, right across from Notre Dame, as a chapel, the, uh, the Servants of the Blessed Sacrament, where they have perpetual, I think it's perpetual adoration, I don't know. But, uh, and so I don't even know how I knew to do this, but I thought, I'm, I'm going to go to that chapel, because they have Jesus there. Like, they have the Eucharist there, and it's on display or something. Like, I didn't know what it was, right? I didn't know what, was, what I was doing. But I can remember walking in and kneeling down and having this realization of, like, oh my gosh. This is the Jesus. This is Jesus who walked on water. This is Jesus who died and rose from the dead. This is, this is, this really is Him alive and glorious, veiled, but nevertheless real. <coughs> and I can remember walking out of that chapel that day and looking across the street at Notre Dame. It was kind of, you know, sideways a little bit and thinking. Do Catholics know this? <laughs> right? But it's literally, it was just like, like, do, do they realize what's going on here? Like, I've studied all of this theology and all of this history, and I realized, like, this is what the church teaches, but I, I don't think Catholics know this. <laughs> the presence is called real, by which is not intended to exclude the other types of presence as if they could not be real too. And so, uh, when, I'm, when I get up in the morning and I get my coffee and I sit down with the scriptures and I experience the Lord's presence reading the scriptures in my home, that is real, right? When I go out in the woods and I see something really beautiful and I'm really thankful to God for uh, creation, that is a real experience of thanksgiving and a real experience of His beauty and goodness coming to me. So the church isn't saying that's not real, that's not what it's saying at all, but, it, but because it is presence in the fullest sense... That is to say, it is substantial presence by which Christ, both God and man, makes himself wholly and entirely present. So when we talk about the real presence, we're talking about this whole and entire presence of Christ. Because Christ our Redeemer said that it was truly his body that he was offering under the species of bread. Remember the Last Supper? He took the bread and he said, I want this to symbolize my body. <laughs> right? He said, this is my body. Remember the power of the word of God. So he says, this is my body. He says, so, so uh, he said that it was truly his body that he was offering under the species of bread. It has always been the conviction of the Church of God and of this Holy Council, this is a quote from Council of Trent, now declares again that by the consecration of the bread and wine, there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord and the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This change the Holy Catholic Church has fittingly and properly called transubstantiation. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Oh my goodness, isn't that awful? Transubstantiation. No, substantiation. You can tell I've, uh, I've talked way too long, right? Oh my gosh, I've talked for a little hour. Um, transubstantiation. Yeah, yeah. It's a complete change. <laughs> wow, I'm going to have totally erase this video. Um, so if the change is complete, that there, it's, there is no bread left, right? There is no wine left. One of the things that uh, Eucharistic ministers sometimes say is like, you know, like, I'll take the cup of wine. It's like, no, it's not wine, right? This isn't, it isn't wine anymore, right? You'll take, you'll take the chalice of the blood. <laughs> that's, that's what you're doing now, right? Um, and, and, and that trans, 
that transubstantiation there, I got there it. Go. is complete. <laughs> I had to not think about it. <laughs> the Eucharistic presence of Christ it begins at the moment of consecration and endures as long as the Eucharistic species subsist. Christ is present whole and entire in each of the species and whole and entire in each of their parts in such a way that the breaking of the bread does not divide Christ. So he is whole and entire in all of it and every part of it. So when I take a tiny sip of wine from the chalice, I am receiving the whole Christ. The celebration of the Eucharistic sacrifice is wholly directed towards the intimate union of the faithful with Christ through communion. To receive communion is to receive Christ himself who offered himself for us. Notice, it's directed towards that intimate living union. If I can interject that word. The fruits of communion really quickly. The principal fruit of receiving communion is this intimate living union with Christ. Communion with the flesh of the risen Christ, a flesh given, uh, given life and giving life through the Holy Spirit, preserves and increases and renews the life of grace received at baptism. So when we receive communion, we are, we are uh, all of the graces of baptism are made present again. <laughs> the Eucharist cannot unite us to Christ without at the same time cleansing us from our past sins and preserving us from future sins. So there's forgiveness that happens in receiving communion. It says, by giving himself to us, Christ revives our love and enables us to break our disordered attachments to creatures and to root ourselves in him. So it actually has an effect upon our attachments to the things of this world. The Eucharist preserves us from future mortal sins. The more we share in the life of Christ and progress in his friendship, the more difficult it is to break away from him by committing a mortal sin. Makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. The more in love I am with my wife, the less likely I am to break the vows of my covenant with her. The more in love with Jesus I, uh, I the more I fall in love with Jesus, the less likely I am to commit a mortal sin. Those who receive the Eucharist are united more closely to Christ, and through it, Christ unites them to all the faithful in one body, the church. Communion renews and strengthens and deepens this incorporation of the church already achieved in baptism. So when Paul talks about uh, this, 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 he talks about the body of Christ in this amazing way. You know, he says uh, that, that basically, like, if one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts, right? Which is kind of a weird thing to think about. And he says, if one part of the body sins, then it affects the whole body. Which means that when I sin, my sin affects the entire body. Right? And so this, this union with the body gets strengthened. My incorporation into the body of Christ gets strengthened through the Eucharist. The church knows that the Lord comes even now in his Eucharist and that he is there in our midst. However, his presence is veiled. Therefore, we celebrate the Eucharist, awaiting the blessed hope and coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, asking to share in your glory when every tear will be wiped away. On that day, we shall see you, our God, as you are, and we shall become like you and praise you forever through Christ our Lord. The anticipation of entering in to the fullness of, uh, of that day at the end. <laughs> it says there is no surer pledge or dearer sign of this great hope in the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells than the Eucharist. Every time this mystery is celebrated, the work of our redemption is carried on. We break the one bread that provides the medicine of immortality, the antidote for death, the food that makes us live forever in Jesus Christ. 
it's kind of like, I love those phrases, right? The medicine of immortality. Imagine what it would be worth if you came up with something today that you could sell to people, and you said, if you take this medicine, you will live forever, how much that would be worth, right? <laughs> The medicine of immortality. The antidote for death. <laughs> See, we've been poisoned by sin, and the wages of sin are death, like we've been poisoned with death. There's nothing we can do about it. But there's an antidote, right? Like if you got bit by a snake, and, and it's like, oh my gosh, I have the poisonous snake, I'm going to die. As long as there's an antidote, <laughs> you're okay, right? The food that makes us live forever in Christ. And then, of course, Jesus' words. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So you can see, uh, I mean, like we just, we just blew through this, right? You could spend an hour on every paragraph, including uh, the dozens of paragraphs that I skipped. But what I wanted to do is just just kind of open up the idea that at every Mass, this cosmic eternal event is happening, and that you being at that Mass is of, of vital importance and significance, not just to you, but to all the rest of the Church and eternity, and probably especially for those people that you're praying for and offering yourself up for, because... For them, that is eternal salvation. See, when the church says there's this rule, you have to go to Mass on Sunday, we say, well, who's the church going to tell me I have to go to Mass on Sunday, <laughs> right? It's like, no, no, you don't understand, right? You don't understand that you being at church and is, is part of your salvation. Right? Like, that the cross is present there, it's my redemption is there. But it's not just my redemption because I can unite myself with his sacrifice and I can offer myself, my measly, silly little life, I can offer it with Christ for the people that I love so that I can be with them for all of eternity. We're talking about like what we're really created for. We're, we're talking about the only reason I exist is to be united with Christ and spend eternity with Him and, and bring as many people with me as I possibly can. That's why we go to Mass. 